So I'm going to go to slow, stop, and reverse. So can we slow it? Yes. Can we stop it or reverse it? No evidence that we can do that today. But let's talk about slow. So we talk I'll, about, I'll jump in on that. I know. We're going we're gonna, to... It's, an, it's, it's anecdotal, anecdotal, but I would say it's anecdata. Okay. Anecdata. <laughs> and so okay. we're going to... Uh, so <laughs> let's slow. We told you to 25 things. Stop getting exposure toxins. We got that. Next one is exercise. So exercise is probably this century the biggest therapeutic advance. Sir William Gowers, when he described Parkinson's disease in the late 1800s, he said the life of someone with Parkinson's disease should be quiet and restful. He was wrong. A hundred percent. If you have Parkinson's disease, you cannot be quiet and the restful. The boxing thing is a real thing that works for should be loud and you should be boxing. I, you should be knocking out Dr. Hyman in the ring okay. with rock steady like boxing. 7,000 steps a day. Um, so we increasingly know that vigorous exercise, amount of exercise to make you sweat, uh, has enormous health benefits. And it turns out it doesn't appear to be which exercise, whether you like to box non-contact boxing you're not hitting people in the head whether you like to swim whether you like to jog it's all beneficial you don't want the pugilistic parkinson's that you don't, you, had. You don't want that and <laughs> we well, talk about that too um and so it turns out that exercise as you know releases brain gr growth factors in the brain and it likely protects the remaining nerve cells and protects them from dying off our colleague dr boss bloom has even shown that you know you can see these changes on imaging so now with imaging you can actually see beneficial therapeutic effects of uh, of exercise and then michael and i both have had patients who have one either not taking medicine for many years because they were just so prominent on exercising two three four hours a day that they've delayed their need for medicine and we have had patients who've been able to come who've decided to come off medications and just uh, treat their Parkinson's disease with exercise yeah. and other behavioral yeah. factors. Although we don't recommend that in general. In general. But but it, but it's something you, we have to have an open mind to. And you said, you know, anecdotes that we see this. So now you want to say stop and reverse. So you know what gets measured gets managed. What gets measured gets managed. And so we- And you've got an MBA, so you know that. That's, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Drucker? Uh, Peter Drucker. Yeah, Peter and Drucker. So, um, <laughs> and so cholesterol, we came to the age where cholesterol was starting to be measured. We only got statins and everything like that mm. because we started measuring mm. cholesterol. Mm. Mm. Hemoglobin A one C, right after mm. we did our training, mm. that we're going to measure the glycolization of hemoglobin as a measure of diabetes, mm. and we do that. But are we measuring? I have never in my entire life. I'm a neurologist. Many pesticides are nerve toxins. I have never measured a pesticide level. Oh, I can help you with that. Okay, so, but exactly. <laughs> but if we're not measuring pesticide levels in in people's bodies, yeah. how can we manage and see if we're taking steps to reduce it? When we did that with lead, when we measured lead in children, sure. we got really, really serious about getting lead out of paint, and lead out of uh, gasoline. Problem is, you need a fat biopsy to properly assess exactly. But there's other ways, and so there are fat biopsies. So if we start to measure these chemicals in our bodies, whether that's in our blood, our urine, our fat, our hair or stool, we can take better actions and be more informed. And if we can start measuring these chemicals in our environment, in our water, in our household dust, in our soil, yeah. in our air, you know, we have a thermostat in this room. Why there's, don't actually, we have a there's actually body things you can now wear that will register the, the, uh, PPMs or particulate matter exactly. in the air. So why don't we, cool. why don't we have a thing that's measuring particulate matter in, in our air? Yeah. Right. That's a more greater determination I mean, indoor, of our indoor health. air pollution is a big thing. Yeah greater determination of our health than the temperature. What gets measured gets managed. Yeah. We need to start measuring these chemicals in our bodies. We need to start measuring these chemicals in our environment so we can figure out what interventions, which you're going to talk about in a second, can reduce these things in our bodies, in our environment, so we can all live longer, healthier lives and perhaps slow, maybe get to the point yeah. that we can stop. So even, at, you know, you just said something like, you know, I never measured a pesticide. So in academic medicine, other than maybe checking your blood mercury or lead, maybe your arsenic. Like, doctors don't know what to do, don't know what labs to send things to, don't know how to test them, right? They're not widely commercially available. You can't just check them off, right. generally speaking, uh, on a lab form. I know you, increasingly I know, now, they are like They are. And so, like, but, you know, when we were in training, no. this would be like... You, but we need to start measuring these things. 100%. Saying, the body yeah. has an embedded system for removal of toxins. Your, you know, sweat, your breath... Mm -hmm your poop, your pee, your liver detox systems, you have enzymes. And I think, you know, as we're beginning to understand genetics, I think in, we're now, we went from a billion dollars, I think it's now 300 bucks to get your whole genome sequence. Yeah. You know, you can actually start to see, oh, I have these detox pathways that may need a little help or my methylation pathways that help also with detox also need a little help. Or, you know, I, I have certain increased needs for X, Y, or Z nutrient, or one third of your genes code for enzymes. Enzymes require 
uh, uh, cofactors or coenzymes, all those are nutrients. Like, so, and we have huge variations, as Bruce Sam says, in, in our need for different nutrients at different doses. So we're all very soon going to be able to sort of create a roadmap of prevention and go, oh, here's your genetics, here's your potholes, here's what you need to do to fix those and prevent it. And so, you know, w- one of the things I want to dive into uh, is, is one, how do we detox? And two, how do we resuscitate our mitochondria? Because, you know, I don't know if you know Suzanne Go. She's a, a pediatric neurologist, uh, Harvard trained, Oxford trained, uh, you know, published in the journal, you know, JAMA, and has basically discovered in autistic kids using very sophisticated MRI imaging, functional MRI imaging, that their mitochondria aren't working. And she provides them mitochondrial cofactors, CoQ10, carnitine, things like that. And they actually get better. Now, I'm wondering, I remember read a study years ago where there was, they used like 1,200 milligrams of CoQ10. Like normally when you take CoQ10, you take 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams. They're using 1,200 milligrams and they found an improvement in their clinical outcomes. So is there any conversation among your colleagues and neurologists, like how do we put together a comprehensive mitochondrial rejuvenation program and what does that look like? Yeah. So, you know, it's a great question. And I think part of it too, you know, Tony Lang um, is one of the leading neurologists in the, in our field in Parkinson disease. And, and uh, when we were talking about him and doing interviews, you know, with him about the book, you talk about when something is, has dysfunction. So it's not working properly or something's kind of dead or degenerating, you know, and like, where is it on that spectrum? Right. And so I think one of the challenges for us is understanding which segments of our cells, we talk about the Zenness, trying to get, get ourselves more Zen, which segments of the Zen are still functioning and can we rescue them, which is what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And could you rescue them with, mm-hmm. let's say, higher dosages of CoQ10 or, or something else? And and which are too far downstream? You know, like they're, they're, they're already gone. They're too far downstream mm-hmm. or we need to look more upstream in like for the answer, right? So is the, is the well, answer going to be Yeah, that? I mean, you're right. You just, I, I, I'm going backwards. I'm going, how do you fix the mitochondria? I realize, how do you fix the toxins? Yeah. So let's go back to the toxins, but stay with the mitochondria for now. Yeah. So so we know when it comes to to toxins for Parkinson, we know that when you take you know toxins, we have a very good friend. He was a mentor of mine at Emory named Tim Greenemeyer. Tim Greenemeyer studied a toxin called rotenone common herbicide it's in people's garages you know it was in that they used it in the creature from the 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 dark lagoon they put it into the water and make the fishes all die mm-hmm. instantly come to the top great visual effect terrible if you're the creature right who's in the in the water but he actually now has parkinson himself mm-hmm. and and uh and he he wrote an article and was interviewed and went public with it in a in a very i think important magazine i think it was in science Thanks. you know which is you know very credible you know reputable magazine yeah. Maybe on the top levels of things, talking about this and talking about the lack of protection. But the thing about rotenone that he studies is it's like MPTP, which is the other toxin that came from the designer drug, you know, um, where they were trying to make a drug called MPP plus and they made MPTP instead. And people yeah, started to right. come it down was, with it was Parkinson. Like, uh... The, the Frozen Addict, if you ever watch the old yeah. PBS special, yeah. you know, and read the book by Bill Langston. Amazing story. And it was because of recreational drugs that we actually got our best That's early right. animal model. That's so people early. say, oh, well, maybe recreational drugs are bad. Maybe not. It, it, it spurred decades of research in Parkinson and important research for my mentor, Malin DeLong, and others. But what do those toxins do, Mark? What does the that do? Mitochondrial poisons. Yes. A complex one of the mitochondrial system. And in fact, it's non-selective for MPTP, which is what we worked with. What was when that? Was what was the street name of that drug again? Uh, like uh, crystal something? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a form, form of heroin. That yeah, it's yeah. A, it's People a methamphetamine. Yeah. It's a methamphetamine yeah, and ecstasy. You know, sort of in that it's yeah, yeah. in that that category of drugs. But it was a designer drug maker trying to make yeah. a designer drug. Yeah. He just got one little thing wrong on the end of that. We're officially in the thick of holiday season. And while everyone's rushing around doing their shopping, I want you to think about something different this year. What if instead of just buying stuff? You gave the gift of health to yourself and the people you love. Because let's be honest, health is the foundation of everything. Now, I'm excited to share something we've never done before. We're offering 30% off the 10-day detox, founding member rates for the Hyman Hive, and 20% off all our supplement stacks, foundational sleep, fertility, immune health, heart health, and lots more. If you're ready to reset your own health or you want to give someone you care about the tools to feel better, now is the time. 
And this sale runs just through December 2nd, so don't miss it. So you take this Complex One, and the one that, that, that Greenemeyer was working with, which was different than my mentor who worked with MPTP, that one go, only does brain cells. In, it only hits Complex One in those dopamine cells, okay, in the brain. It's very specific yeah. box into that. And then Greenemeyer himself ended up with Parkinson disease and talked about how he probably should have been more protective. And he's very open, you know, about his his story. And I think that's a real really, you know, great thing. And the question is, is, um, is, is access to, so let's say, um, somebody in functional medicine wants to address mitochondrial dysfunction. Awesome idea. Okay. And there are a lot of drugs out there that are addressing it. You got to beat the, the leaky brain. So that's good, right? You got to beat the leaky brain. You got to get to, and there's mitochondria in other areas besides the brain too, that may be affected as well. And, uh, and then you've got to figure out, you know, how, how far down the system is it gone? What's the dose, you know, response on that. And here we are spending like two cents out of every dollar on prevention. We're yeah. spending like zero on every dollar trying to figure out, you know, how we could actually try to, resuscitate and improve the functioning, make them make those cells more zen. Well, this is really important what you're saying, because, you know, one of the failures of modern medicine came out of Louis Pasteur, which had a lot of benefits, discovered bacteria, but it was like, oh, there's a single cause for a single disease treated by a single drug. you got pneumococcal bacteria causing pneumococcal pneumonia, treated with penicillin, boom, end of story. And we've been chasing that false tiger for a hundred plus years for chronic disease, which it doesn't apply. And these conditions are all multifactorial, meaning there's multiple causes, and you need multimodal treatments, meaning you need a lot of different things. You mentioned exercise, you mentioned reducing your exposures, you mentioned you know, mitochondrial therapies, you mentioned L-dopamine. There's lots more things, and you can't just do one thing. And the, pe people will say, well, you know, how do you do a randomized control trial? You don't know what works. Let's just try CoQ10. Or no, let's just try lipoic acid. Or let's just try blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. Like <laughs> it's like It's like saying, it's like saying, we're going to create, uh, we want to win the NBA playoffs, but we're only going to put Michael Jordan on the team yeah. and he's got no other players on the team. He's going to lose every time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and, you know, I think, I think this is a yeah. fundamental flaw in, in research and I don't know how to answer that. Well, let me just add, like, to just add on to that and just pile on a little bit and just say, we talk about in the book about combination therapies. Remember, carbidopa, levodopa is a combination therapy. Yeah. You need the two to get yeah. it to the brain, right? And to reduce the nausea, get it out of the blood and up into the brain past blood memory barrier, right? They, that leaky area, right? And and HIV drugs. We talk about HIV drugs and heart therapy, which was, you know, where you take a bunch of these drugs together in combination and that was the winner, right? You talk about cancer chemotherapy. Malcolm Gladwell loves talking uh, about this, telling the story. We tell a, a piece of that story again, the most disagreeable guy at NIH ever that you wouldn't want to be in the same room because he's, you know, such a curmudgeon. It takes a guy like that to challenge the system to cure these kids with leukemia, yeah. put these combinations yeah. together. Yeah. Now we're so far down the road and and yet we're still not thinking in yeah. combinations. No, and so I just wanted to, to add you. on to what yeah, you're thanks. saying, you know, like, well, what are we doing? Here? Well, so I, I think I'm going to come back to the, how do you remove toxins? Cause that's like going upstream, but you know, often like you can intervene with mitochondrial therapies and you can get pretty, you know, um, I would say complex because there's a lot of different pathways, a lot of different enzymes, a lot of steps. So CoQ10 we've talked about, um, we didn't talk about this, but NAD or NMN, which is a, a common longevity now supplement, but that actually plays a big role in mitochondrial function. Creatine, which has been shown to help you have been neuro different neurological diseases. Helps your thinking in some Helps of these thinking. recent studies. Yeah, too. I mean, yeah. Uh, that's why I'm so smart this morning. I did, yeah, I did my 10, 10 grams of creatine. I had chronic fatigue syndrome as a result of mercury poisoning living in China. And I can tell you my CPK, which is muscle enzymes, were 600 for years until I figured out how to fix my mitochondria. So, you know, then there's things that help like other antioxidants, like N-acetylcysteine, things that boost glutathione. There's phytochemicals like resveratrol, curcumin, green tea extract, carnitine, the, all the B vitamins, which are cofactors, particularly riboflavin, niacin, B1, I mean, B2, B3, uh, all the methylation vitamins, B6, folate, B12, um, magnesium. And e even there's interesting things like peptides, like SS31 and humanin and MOTC, which are kind of a little bit beyond the conversation we're having here, but that are 
our body's own biological way of regulating our mitochondrial function. Peptides are essentially the body's like communication superhighway system. And we, we've been using them in medicine for years. Insulin's a peptide, GLP-1s are a peptide. So like they're, they're, they're things that can help the body function better. So what I find is those things can be really great, but you have to first deal with the gut. You have to first deal with reducing toxic load. And so that's where I think, you know, you know, we're, we really need to start funding these trials on using these, these multifactorial um, assessments, like, let's look at all the potential causes. Do you have mold? Do you have mercury? Do you have pesticides? Do you have, you know, suffer from household cleaning chemicals? Are you exposed to uh, particular air pollution? Like, what's your... Ego? And we have AI. We have the ability to now deal with yeah. multiple factors, right? Like, 100%. never before. No, like, it's, today it's in the age that we're in, yet we don't study these. We don't. And then, and then you know, we, once, you, once you understand those, you start to kind of address all those systematically. And then you start to resuscitate and repair the body. So you take out the bad stuff, put in the good stuff. That's what functional medicine is, really. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.